And when you say that, it makes me so much that she walk around. <laughs> like the street guy. Good evening, good evening, good evening to everyone. So glad to have you join us here at Mount Calvary Missionary Baptist Church here in the wonderful and awesome city of Goldsboro, North Carolina. And we're so glad to have you join us uh, this evening. Somebody may say, well, Pastor Gavin, it's a rainy and clement day all day today, but you know what? You are alive. Uh, we're almost through with another day's journey. It's so good to have all of you here at Mount Cavern and here. I have a number of people here tonight. Uh, so glad to have you join us by Facebook and or by teleconference. Uh, so I say to all of you, so good to see you. Grace and peace unto you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we're still in the uh, season of celebrating uh, Lent. We celebrate Lent. Because we know that through the vicarious death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his resurrection, we are saved by his grace and his mercy. And it is my task on this part two tonight to help us all to understand some of the reasons why we celebrate Lent. I realize that it's custom of some of our churches to celebrate Lent, but the question is, as individuals and as a group, as a church family, why do we do it? Why do people celebrate Lent? Do you celebrate Lent, brothers and sisters, because it's just a traditional thing to do? Uh, this is the season for it. We've just been doing it because we thought it was a good idea to fast because we need to lose a little weight. Uh, we thought it was a good idea to fast because we just want to prove that we can do something on our own by mind control or, or the will of the mind. But I want to uh, beg to argue with you tonight, and I don't mean that in the literal way, that Lent is so much more than that. Lent is so much more than just individualistic going without something uh, and just taking in anything. But Lent is about understanding God's activity in the world. Lent is about the message of salvation uh, through the vicarious death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lent uh, is about uh, the salvation message of God through the words and the works of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When we understand that, then we will definitely kind of grasp what it means to celebrate Lent, what it means to fast and to pray. I know we say for 40 days, and uh, but I think because this is a leap year this year and we don't include Sundays, it's 36 days that we celebrate Lent. Um, and we realize that on this Wednesday, as we head toward uh, Gethsemane, and as we head toward Calvary, and the third day resurrection morning, on this Wednesday, over 2,000 years ago, is the last week of the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, on that Wednesday, Jesus is in Bethany, and he's there uh, relaxing from all of his ministerial work because he knew that his impending death was vastly approaching. Because you remember on the Tuesday prior to Wednesday, 
he was there in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper. And we understand that Mary, the sister of uh, Martha and Lazarus, anointed the Savior's feet, preparing him for his death. But here on this Wednesday, our Lord is still there in Bethany as he receives honor as, as the king. He, see, he receives honor as the Savior, as the Messiah. You know, every now and then, brothers and sisters, before we go into the lesson tonight, before I pray, even Jesus proves on this Wednesday that uh, taking a sabbatical and a rest from the labors of ministry is very important. And I do understand that this was a time in Bethany that he was probably still teaching because he knew that his time wasn't long on the earth. And maybe he was doing some teaching with his disciples. Maybe he was doing some teaching and sharing with Lazarus. Mary and Martha. I'm not sure the Bible doesn't decree that, but in my mind's eye, I can see that the Lord is probably, in his human capacity, he's probably getting a little, a little maybe a little nervous, getting a little heavy at heart. Because as humans, that's what happens when we know that we're approaching something that's tragic in our lives. And as I begin to understand that and believe in that, I begin to think about Lent. I begin to think about why we celebrate it. And so I've come up with my five C's. And if you lend me your ears closely tonight, we're going to finish up with part two. My five C's of, of, of celebrating Lent and the importance of Jesus' death and resurrection, which includes that salvation message. If you lend me your ears for a few minutes tonight, we're going to break bread with you and then we're going to let you go. Amen? Amen. Let us bow here. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. We thank you that it is so that you allowed us to be here tonight. Yes. And as we move forward, Lord, in understanding the importance of Jesus' death and resurrection, the salvation message of God, that you will continue to bless us by opening our minds and opening our hearts to receive this, your word. Now, God, I ask that you would bless every participant tonight. Bless everyone that's sitting here in Mount Calvary. Bless everyone that's watching and listening to us tonight. And as we finish this series, God, that and we head into uh, Good Friday, and we head into that Sunday morning resurrection service, that you will continue to bless us and keep, you, keep us in your care. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church of God said, Amen. 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 Just a rehashing of last week's lesson. Brothers and sisters, let me say to you tonight that in order to understand or to grasp Lent, we have to understand, number one, I said it last week, we have to understand the covenant. The covenant of God is what we base our life on, right? The covenant of God was given to his people, uh, Israel, if you read Exodus chapter 6, verses uh, 6 through 7, it talks about that when God promises Moses that he would deliver the people of Israel from slavery. And let's stop right there. Because I'm not going to cover, cover the whole waterfront from last week. I just want to tell you that in Exodus 6, 6 and 7, God makes a, a unilateral promise that his people would no longer be bound by slavery. He would be the liberator to set the people free. We believe that just as God fulfilled his promises for Israel, God has a plan to free us and to liberate us from sin through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? Amen. God has an ultimate salvation message for all of us, all of us, who know that in his infinite power and through the power of the covenant, that God can and God will do it. I said last week, brothers and sisters, that Jesus said on many occasions, uh, especially in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, that he came to fulfill. So the covenant is about fulfilling. That means if you have a cup, You fill it full in order to quench your thirst. Right? So he came to fulfill 
the law. Y'all must understand that the law is the covenant. It is the unilateral covenant. It is the law. And Jesus comes along and says, I did not come to abolish it, but I've come to make it make sense. I've come to give you a salvation message through my word, through my works, through my death, and through my resurrection. Jesus fulfills the demands of God. He fulfills it, right? Brothers and sisters, let me challenge you with this thought that uh, the covenant or the law could only take us so far. The Old Testament was types and shadows of a greater person that was to come. No longer by uh, sheep or oxen or bullocks that were sacrificed in Israel as a portrait of taking away sins of Israel. When they had to keep sacrificing, they had to do it. They had to sacrifice all the time. A bunch of dead animals running around. I mean, not running around, a bunch of animals running around that were killed that were not dead because of the sacrifices. But there was one, brothers and sisters, that was coming along. It would only be one sheep of God that would be slain to fulfill all that we experience today. The love and the mercy of God. And to really understand that, you've got to understand the covenant. What is a covenant? He said, well, Pastor Gamble, what is that? Well, God's covenant is different than man's covenant. It's different than a woman's covenant. A woman's covenant or a man's covenant is like a 50-50 partnership. Or it's a split. It don't have to be 50-50. It could be 70-30. Right? It could be 40-60. But it's a covenant. Brother, I shake your hand and make a covenant that we're going to work together to do whatever. Right? But the thing I know about God's covenant is what we call a unilateral covenant, which means that God makes all the provision. In this covenant, God makes all the provision. Amen. Amen. Yes, he does. That's his grace and his mercy. Jesus said, this is the last thing I want to say about the covenant. The covenant of God in the New Testament is found uh, in Matthew 17, 22, and 23. Matthew 17, 22, and 23. The Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of, the, of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life. However, the disciples do not understand what he means and are afraid to ask him about it. That's the beginning of the covenant, that the Son of Man, after all Jesus had done, dear sister, after all he had said, yet people misunderstood him, people misconstrued his word, right? They said he was blasphemy against God, right? They trumped up charges of treason on him. He said he would, they would kill him, and that's what I see here. The, delivered into the hands, the Son of Man, not the Son of God, oh Jesus, but the Son of Man. That's there for a purpose. You say, well, Pastor Gavin, I have people asking me in my teaching in the last 25, 30 years, they say, well, what, why not the Son of God? Well, the Son of God can never be killed. Amen. <laughs> Listen, he didn't die as God, he died as a man. Y'all got me now? Right. He was human just like we're human. Mm -hmm. He said, well, Pastor, what does it have to do with the covenant? Sounds well, right. we as humanity broke the covenant. Y'all ain't praying with me tonight. Mm -hmm. God says, do one thing and we said, no, God, we have a better way. We broke the covenant. Mm -hmm. The Lord says, Thou shalt have no other God before me. But humanity says, no, we want a golden calf. Uh -huh. God says, when you go into the land, do not intermingle with other nations, because if you play with dirt long enough, this is my saying, if you play with dirt long enough, it's going to get on you. What did they do? They went and played with dirt. <laughs> Y'all got me now, right? So we broke God's covenant, man did. Yes. Right? God says, thou shalt not kill. Right? We said, well, Pastor Gallman, I hadn't killed nobody. 
Come on now. Somebody don't total lie on somebody. Somebody don't denigrate somebody. Somebody don't dehuman so, dehumanize somebody, right? Somebody don't lie and didn't tell the truth. Amen. Amen. All have sinned. Yeah, look at all my people smiling at me. I know. I know. It's, it's, it's a hard bit of pill to swallow. But we all have sinned and coming short of the glory of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and everything God made. The Bible says, y'all know, y'all taught this to us in Sunday school, that everything God made was good. And what? And when he looked at it, he said, it is good. Thank you. And all of a sudden, in that goodness, something happened. Something happened. Sin. Sin creeps in. Disobedience, however you want to call it, creeps in and destroys the goodness. And then, out of destroying the goodness, the goodness became for us failure. Failure. And when we failed, we couldn't do nothing about it. We couldn't pray our way out of it. We couldn't talk our way out of it. We couldn't live our way out of it. We were failure, human failure, because you turned your back on the goodness of God. Yes. Y'all pray with me here. So it's important to know that because there had to be somebody that was perfect in the sight of God. And the only one I believe that was perfect in the sight of God was the Son of God. Hey, I'm going to put the Son of God here for a reason, first of all. Was the Son of God. The reason I put the Son of God here is because he was the Son of God. But in order to save us imperfect people, he had to become the Son of Man. Y'all gonna get something here tonight. Y'all gonna really celebrate man. He became the son of man. Man for man. Right? The Bible said, didn't the Bible say that deep? The Bible said that no sin was found in him. No sin. And no sin was found in him. Listen. He was tempted just as we are, dear sister, yet without sin. Y'all remember the Matthew story when, when Satan, uh, the spirit driving him into the wilderness and he was tempted three times by Satan? Yet he did not sin because many occasions he said, it is written. Yes. I serve the Lord and only he shall we serve. So you serve. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Amen. And so here's the last thing about the covenant. I'm just trying to get you to this place, brothers and sisters. All I'm trying to do is get you to this place so when you celebrate this Resurrection Sunday, you can really give God the praise. Yes. Amen. And so Jesus says, to follow up in the last thing, he says, he sits there in that little obscure upper room with this boys there. And, you know, Judas, he got up in love. He wasn't even a part of the whole thing. But Jesus says, uh, this bread represents my body. This cup represents my sacrificial blood. And all as you do drink it, you do show forth the Lord's death and his suffering till he comes. This is my blood of the covenant, Matthew chapter 26, verse 28, which is poured out for many, like the like they used to do with the scapegoat in Israel. He, his blood was poured out for many. Sister Bess, your daughter sings that so wonderfully. It reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. There's power. And y'all remember that song we used to sing in the old Baptist church? There's power in the precious blood of the lamb that was slain. The, la the, the lamb that was slain. There were many songs that talked about the blood. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. Their sinners uh, plunged beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stain. Jesus says, Whoa, my blood has been poured out for what? One thing the forgiveness of. Jesus did not do that as the Son of God. He said the Son of Man must be delivered because you cannot take the Son of God nowhere. He's too powerful for that. Amen. You can't take God. He neither slumbers nor his sleep, nor does he sleep. But Jesus, he slumbered and he slept. He was a man, right? Can you say amen? amen. Jesus amen. cried over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killeth the prophets. He cried over Jerusalem. Didn't he not do it? 
He toiled with his hands. The Bible said he was a carpenter. Right? He was a handyman. Yeah. A carpenter in that day in Israel was what we call a handyman today. He knew how to fix stuff. Mm -hmm. Gotta get a witness here. Yes, People take stuff to his, him and Joseph's shop and they would fix stuff. He was a handyman. He tore with his hands like a man. He cried like a man. He was exasperated because of their unbelief like a man. How many times must I suffer thee? <laughs> you know? But he said his blood is the new cup. Let me put that right here. Which is poured out or shed, y'all King James enthusiast. Shed for many. For what? Y'all got to write that down. Forgiveness. Forgiveness of sin. He ain't talking about his sin because he knew no sin. He talking about us. Amen. So let's move on. So, my thing, brothers and sisters, when you move past the covenant, you move past the covenant. You got to move past the covenant, y'all. Because the covenant leads to a couple other things. The covenant leads to us being convicted. Your brother, you got to be convicted. Conviction is very important. We believe, and, and when I say this, I want y'all to say amen after I say this to all the people on Facebook and hear y'all say amen. They can't see your face, but they can know you're saying amen, all right? Listen, we believe that the covenant is good. Amen? Amen. 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 See, that heard that. <laughs> And we seek to be found favorable in the sight of God because of the covenant, right? Yes. The convicting work of the Holy Spirit involves the revelation of areas of sin, right? So because of the covenant, I am convicted that the covenant is true based on the convincing work of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. Amen. Don't you know, brothers and sisters, when you're bound by the covenant, the new covenant that Jesus gave us, right? God, y'all write that down, is a conviction. God convicts us. Don't you know the reason sometimes you feel sorrowful, brothers and sisters? Y'all listen to me now. Sometimes you feel bad, brothers and sisters, when you bless somebody out. Y'all ain't saying that here. Come on. Sometimes. Sometimes you, I'm talking about Christian folk now. I'm not talking about those who are under the ark of safety. I'm talking to those who are covered by the Lamb of God, the blood of the Lamb of God. The reason we feel, <laughs> reason we feel bad sometimes when we are saying something we shouldn't have said or did something we shouldn't have, do, we shouldn't have done, right? The reason we try to hide and, and run away so people won't see us when we've done wrong is because God not going to let you get away because he's convicting you that we, that we were wrong. Let me make that inclusive. I said you, I said we, all of us. We were wrong. God ain't going to let you go. So when you say you're saved, you better know what you're talking about because when you say you're saved and you have the power of the Holy Ghost living in you, God, can, after the covenant, he convicts us. Yes. Watch yourself, Pastor Gallon, my God. Watch yourself, man. Listen. Sin, such as pride, one of the great deadly sins is pride. No, it's not nothing wrong with taking pride in your accomplishments and pride in what you do and your work or your job and your family and community. He's not talking about, I'm talking about fools go with pride. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, well, pride makes us do foolish things and think we're above everybody else. All right. Right. The Holy Spirit convicts us. Listen, you got a little bit of education. God has blessed you with a few uh, uh, more breadcrumbs than others. God has blessed you, and now you're prideful. God gave you a car, and you won't even drive to church. Watch out, Pastor. <laughs> hey, you better watch out now. <laughs> God blessed you to have some nipples and dimes in your pocket, and you won't even pay your tithes and offering. <laughs> God convicts you, and you try to sleep it off. You can't. You can't sleep God's conviction off. Anybody other than me done done wrong in your life and God wakes you up late in the middle of the night, late in the midnight hour, you sleeping going on. Why can't I sleep? Because God is convicting you that you're wrong. That we're wrong. You walk, I walk the floor all night long. Well, the reason you walk the floor all night night long because you have done somebody wrong. You say that in God convicts us based on the covenant of the forgiveness of sin. 
jealousy, anger, lust, lying, selfishness, prompting us to confess and repent. So what conviction does, at least it's going to lead to what we're talking about tonight, it leads us to somewhere. Listen, when I'm wrong and you're wrong and God can fix us, we must do some confessing. What does confess me? I must acknowledge the reason I woke up in a bad sweat last night because I said something and did something that was wrong. See, you become or we become hypocritical to ourselves and we say we ain't never sinned. Well, the Bible says you are a hypocrite. He says, if a person says they've never sinned, you are lying and the truth ain't in you. Pastor, if you call me no lie, I, I, do. I didn't call you a lie. Yo, Pastor called me a liar. I didn't call you a liar. I just said the Bible said, if you said you had never said, you a liar and the truth ain't in you. So if you're going to argue with anybody, when you leave here tonight and you turn this Facebook off tonight, you're going to argue with God. Because I didn't say amen. I love teaching you. Can y'all tell you? about my wrongs, and I talked about that for about five weeks, a couple of weeks ago, about forgiveness, right? About forgiveness, forgetting, right? About reconciliation and healing. Did I not teach that for about five weeks? Mm -hmm. This is, listen, if I'm wrong, I'm just wrong, right? I got to confess, not only to God, but I got to confess in what I'm wrong. Listen, you know, from my heart, I apologize. And like, like um, Zacchaeus, I love the story of Zacchaeus. Because he broke his neck to get up that sycamore tree to see Jesus. He was a short guy, short statue, brother. He was short. And so, you know, have you ever seen a sycamore tree? A sycamore tree has branches that reaches out almost like you're reaching out for God. And Zacchaeus climbed this sycamore tree, and, and Jesus was going through Jericho. Is that right, Bible school teachers? He was going through Jericho. And he looks up and he says, hey, come on down from that tree. For tonight, I'm going to eat at your house. And all right. And the covenant is, is about being convicted. And, and Zacchaeus was convicted that this man was an unusual man. He was convicted that Jesus was an unorthodox rabbi, not like the ones they were used to. Zacchaeus comes down, and the Bible says, dear sister, that he wasn't just an ordinary tax collector, he was the chief. He was the head man. He was the chief. And when he came down, Jesus goes into his house. And can you use your, uh, your imagination with me, Facebook watchers, y'all? Use your spiritual imagination. You know what kind of folk was in Jack Zacchaeus' house? Come on. Come on now. I doubt they were Christian folk. <laughs> I used to work Christian. I know they had Christian back that day, but I'm just using it as reference, reference today. Brother, they didn't have no Christian folk, no saved folk back in there. I bet you he had prostitutes in there. I bet you he had tax collectors in there. I bet you he had wine billers in there. I bet you he had all kind of fornicators in there, adulterers in there. I bet you he had all kind of folk in that house. Because that's the kind of folk he was around. But here comes Jesus, the son of man, who came to save humankind. He walks into Zacchaeus' house and, and and when Jesus gets through, I don't know what Jesus said when he got in there, but I know what they said on the outside. They said, look at him. And he calls himself a rabbi of Israel. And look, he's going to die with sinners. Come on, yes, sir. Jesus gets in there, sit down there, had a good time with them prostitutes, and a good time with them wine bibbles, and a good time with those alcoholics. Jesus went in there letting him know that God is here. And when he got finished, I'm talking about conviction. When Jesus got finished, Zacchaeus was convicted so much, he says, I'm going to give back more than I took. Amen. See, there's no really no reconciliation with your brothers and sisters, dear brothers and sisters, until you give back what you stole. Amen. If I stole a dime from you, I'm going to give you back 25 cents. I'm going to give back more than what I took. 
And you know what Jesus says to Zacchaeus because of his conviction? Today, salvation has come to your home. That leads to confession. So brothers and sisters, we understand the covenant. And then God convicts us. Because it's, the covenant was about, remember the covenant was about forgiveness of sin. Right? And then after the conviction, then you got to come to this one big word right here that we love. Confession. Confession involves, it's right there in your syllabus, and Brother, if you don't have a syllabus back there, share with him. I think, I don't know if you have a, a syllabus, but share with him back there so he can see this too. Or you can just follow me on the board. You can follow me on the board. Confession involves admitting our sins to God. Let me say that one more time. Confession involves admitting our sins to God. Amen? Amen. Would you turn with us, and Brother Turner put that into the Facebook page, turn with us to the Old Testament book of Leviticus. I'm going to give you a chance to find that. It might not be a usual book for a lot of us. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 21. Let's look at what the let's look at what it says here in the book of Leviticus, Old Testament book of Leviticus, chapter 16, verse 21. If you find the Holy Record, let the church say amen. Amen. And this is talking about the escape goat that they would use. I spoke about earlier when they would is a symbolic act of taking away the sins of the people. Listen to what it says. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send that goat away, send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed for the task. That's the story of the scapegoat. That's where we get that, that word scapegoat, right? For the forgiveness, listen, it said for the, for the forgiveness, listen to me closely, not of an individual, but the whole nation. Amen. Amen. Brother, because when one sin in Israel, God included all of them. Yes. Achan couldn't get away. You remember the story of Achan? Achan stole that precious uh, idol, mm -hmm. right? He couldn't get away. Who suffered? Not only Achan. Oh. Hey, brother, you about to say, you about to come up here and teach this thing tonight. All of them suffer. So, he says here, he is to lay both hands on the head of the light though, and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion. Wickedness. Now listen, isn't that two bad words to use for covenant people? Wickedness and rebellion. And we think we as Christians today can get away from that. But just like in the days of Leviticus, right? we don't do that like that because we already have one lamb that has died and taken away and forgive us of our sins. But it takes what? Confession. What is confession? Well, it comes from a word that means to acknowledge. Listen. And seeking forgiveness for those we have wronged. For those we have wronged, those who have your Bibles again, keep your Bibles open and turn with us to James chapter 5, verse 16. Let's look at a little New Testament here. James chapter 5, verse 16. Let's look at that. James chapter 5. It comes out the Hebrew. Right before First Peter. James chapter 5, verse 16. Let's look at what it says. Let's look at what it says when it comes to wronging others. Okay. I see a few pages turning here. Wait till you find it. One of my members said they got a brand new Bible back there. He loved it. <laughs> He's just turning pages. He said, Pastor, look at my brand new Bible. I said, we're going to be turning that page, those pages tonight, brother. 
I'm sure you that are watching, I have your Bible, your iPads, your phone. But see, hey, brothers and sisters that's watching me, I got, I got contemporary, traditional people here tonight. I got some looking at it on their phones, some turning pages. Amen. Okay, so let's look at this. Let's look at what it says. It says here in verse 16 of James chapter 5. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be what? Healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Can I read that one more time? If you don't mind. Therefore, therefore means to continue to do something. Confess or acknowledge your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. There are a lot of folks that are not healed tonight because they have not confessed some wrongness in their lives. Amen. And it says, I know you always say the prayer of the righteous availeth much. I know what it says. But it says here in the NIV, the prayer of a righteous person mm -hmm. is powerful and effective. So they use a righteous, a righteousness in the same context as confession. Confession is based on righteousness. It is right to <laughs> confess. Is that right? I can't, how, brothers and sisters, how can we pray and and be convicted of our wrongness by God and we never confess that we wrong somebody else. Or somebody has wronged us. Or we wrong somebody else. Or did somebody else wrong. And then it, it, it mixes it in, it mixes it together with prayer. So we pray for one another. Listen, we lift one another up. So we can be healed. And I want to tell you in this land in which we live and in our churches, there needs to be some healing. There needs to be some prayer. You say, well, Pastor, how powerful is prayer? Prayer has some healing mechanism to it. Yes, sir. Can I get a witness here tonight? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A righteous person that prays, right, even when you wrong somebody, a righteous person that prays makes heaven move. Mm -hmm. The foundation of heaven quakes and it shakes when a righteous man or woman prays to God. And God says some healing. You might be feeling a little bad right now because you've been convicted because you've done something wrong, but when you confess that based on that conviction and you can pray that you have wronged somebody, right, and you're still righteous now, it doesn't take away your righteousness, but it enables you to mature and to heal and to move forward. Amen. Listen, that's what it says there. Yep. Confess your sins. Now that becomes personal now. It becomes personal and then it becomes unified. It becomes personal, then it becomes a unification. See, because one chases a thousand and two chases ten thousand. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is when we pray, see, I can't pray up, and you know, that's why I have my things about uh, you know, other religions. I'm not going to say, you know, because I might have some people that are watching, but I believe that as individuals, I don't have to have anybody pray for me. I, and I love if you pray for me. Mm -hmm. I want you to pray for me. I need prayer work. But don't you know we can go to God for ourselves? Amen. Amen. I don't have to drive across town and sit in this booth and, and wait for you know who to come in. And, you know, say, you know, I just leave it at that. You know what I'm talking about. We can go to God for ourselves. Ain't that right? Yes, Jesus died so we can go to God for ourselves. Amen. But don't let that prayer just stay in and of ourselves. Pray for healing so we can help somebody else. Amen. Right? So let's move on. So, uh, if we confess our sins, this is what John, 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. 1 John, 1 John chapter 1, I mean, chapter, what was that? 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. Y'all turn there. 1 John. I know I got a John in here, but we're going to turn to 1 John. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. It 
to the operative word. So that's the operative word right there. Confession if. You know that word if is important. If is the operative word, which means you don't have to do it. See, you can wrong somebody, and you don't have to ask, you don't have to acknowledge it. That's why that if is very important. But I would say it like this. Y'all watch me here. If, if you know that you're caught up in this pride, this jealousy, this lying, this thinking it's all about you and nobody else, if you are convicted, see all that goes together. If you have been convicted, if, if, it says here, if we claim to be without sin, no, excuse me, I said, if we confess our sins. See, if we have been convicted and confessed, I got to confess based on my conviction. And it says, he is faithful. Who is he? God is faithful and just. And y'all, y'all stop right there for a second. It says, God is faithful. And God is what? Just. Justified. He's faithful. And it says, will forgive us based on if we decide to do it or not. Y'all are going to pray with me tonight. I'm not preaching to you. I'm just teaching to you. Now, I can preach if you want me to, but y'all hear that on Sunday. I got a good one for you on Sunday. So invite your friends and family on Sunday. Listen. And purify us or cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the healing. Healing is being cleansed or purified. Or to purify. Or to be clean. Or to be made clean. Right? Clean and purify the same words. There's just two words, two, two different words that mean the same thing. Purified and clean. It says here, He is faithful and will forgive us. See, he said, well, Pastor, there's that word again that we cannot escape. It's unescapable. So what word is unescapable? Well, the word is unescapable is what I just said about the covenant. Forgive. Or forgiveness of sin. Here it is again. He is faithful. Forgive us. You see, all of this kind of just rolls together as one. You can't have one without having the other. In order to understand Lent and to be more proficient in understanding Lent and why we fast and pray, you got to understand that word if. If we confess our sin, and I'm, I'm going to move to the last one in just a second. We're going to get out here earlier tonight. Listen, if we confess, my secretary over there last one, she said, no, we're not. <laughs> Faith don't be too well. <laughs> yes, we are, sister. We are. Listen, if we confess somebody else's sin, <laughs> it was them, God, not me. <laughs> uh, what was that flip once used to say? The devil made me do it. <laughs> If I get quick stir, my cousin gonna kill me. Quick stir, my cousin. He told me one time when he was in high school, he said that he didn't study the lesson, and they had a uh, had a, a test the next day. So he said he did a cheat sheet. I said he did a cheat sheet. He said, Come on, he's not right to answer me <laughs> in his hand. I hope my cousin ain't watching this. Well, I hope he is watching because we talk about it all the time. He wrote the app, he wrote the answers in his hand. <laughs> and then we got when he got to class, he said, he said, he said, what from when I got to class and the teacher gave us the test, he said, Oh man, I knew all the answers on the test without looking in his hand on the cheat. And so he said we started taking the test. You know how back in the day the teachers would walk by? <laughs> and the teacher looked at him 
Is it okay, Mr. I said, what cousin that? Okay, Mr. So-and-so, that's a zero for you. He said, Mr. So-and-so, why you give me a zero? She said, I saw that cheat that you cheated. <laughs> he said, no, Mr. So-and-so, I didn't cheat. I knew the answer. He said, no, that's a zero for you. And as a matter of fact, I want you to go to the person's office. And then she said, Mr. So-and-so, why did you do it? If you know why did you cheat? He said, the only thing you can say was, the devil made me do it. <laughs> I said, man, I said, man, you crazy. No, you didn't say that. He said, man, I said, he said, everybody in class, like you tonight, we started laughing at him in class. You see, but I said that to say this, we got to confess our own fault. Amen. Amen. Because you know what? I'm at a stage in my life now, and you're at a stage in your life, I'm tired of being broken. I'm tired of being unhealthy. I'm tired of going through situations in my mind and my heart that make me hurt in the midnight hour. Mm -hmm. I need to be healed. And when I'm healed, then I can help somebody else be healed. And we can all be healed together. Amen. But I can't confess for you and you can't confess for me. But if we both confess it together, we can hold hands together. Mm -hmm. Don't y'all notice at Mount Calvary, the Lord led me to say, hold somebody's hand. Mm -hmm. You know, and as you pray for yourself, pray for that other person. Mm -hmm. Because we just said the prayers of the righteous is very effective and it's powerful. You know? And don't you know it's a glorious thing to hear a brother and sister pray, not only for themselves, but pray for you? That's where the healing starts. And then you know, all of a sudden, it don't take a lot of people to do it. It just takes a few people to do it and watch God begin to work. That's on the confession. Amen? Amen. Oh, excuse me, on the, uh, excuse me, on the conversion. I'm sorry. I thought about that. Oh, confession. Oh, I, I kind of jumped all over the place. But, yeah, I jumped all over the place. I'm sorry. I jumped all over the place. But let, let's, let's go on. Let's go on. I got conversion. I got conversion. Conversion means is a... Yeah, I got, I got all this mixed up. But, but, but I, I can go through it. I, got, I can go through it. I've been studying it long enough. <coughs> what is conversion? Because I got conversion down there where commitment is, and it's not meant to be there. You see that? Spiritual turn. Yeah. yeah. Come, I, I got it. I got it. It's under commitment. <laughs> it's under commitment. I got it typed in wrong. Hey, I must confess that I was going too fast. <laughs> conversion, what is conversion? <coughs> Let's look at conversion. Conversion is what I just said. Confession is admitted. Confession is acknowledged. That's what confession is. But conversion is a turn. It's a turn. That means we were going one way, right? And based on our confession, God turns us to a, another way. It's a turn. It's a spiritual turning away from sin, right? And repentance to Jesus Christ in faith. How do you know that when you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, God saves you? When God saves you, there is a turning. Turning in the way I think. Turning in the way I orchestrate my life and your life. There's a turning. It is a dramatic turning away from one path to pursue an entirely new one. Right? That's what happened on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost came. It was a conversion. That's what happened in the house of Cornelius. Do y'all remember the story of Cornelius? And I'm going to end my lesson tonight talking about Cornelius. And then I'm going to talk about commitment. Cornelius' whole house, y'all remember that? In uh, Acts chapter 10. Let's turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. And again, y'all forgive my mistake here. I get so excited what I'm doing that sometimes I kind of watch stuff together. But I study so much I can get it what we need to be. Acts chapter 10, verses 33. Starting at verse 33. Let me know where you find me. Say amen. 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 
I'm, a, I'm, a, uh, I'm going to read, I'm going to start at verse 44, because I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to start at verse 44 of Acts chapter 10. After Peter gives his overview, after Peter gives his sermon in the house of Canute, you know, they met up because Peter saw he went to sleep with this trance, right? And he saw all these four footed hooves and beasts and animals come down, and the Spirit of God says, Slay and eat. And he tells, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. God says, Don't call what I've made unclean. And then at that time, Cornelius had sent his men to the house. Peter had brought him back to his house. This is what conversion is all about. But in verse number 44, Cornelius had all of his family, all of his slaves, all of it in his house. And Peter began to preach. They wanted Peter to preach. And if you read uh, up to verse 44, if you look at verse 34, but if you look at verse 33, let's start at 33, then we'll go to 44. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good for you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded uh, you to tell us. And so Peter begins to preach. If you read 34 all the way down to uh, 43, and then jump to 44, it says, While Peter was still speaking these words, what words? The words of God. The Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of them being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days, for a few, for a few days. That's the word of God for people of God. So Cornelius, brothers and sisters, he was a Gentile centurion, but he believed in Israel's God. It was a conversion, and that's what I, that's what I said, brothers and sisters, not only for him, because what good would it have been for him to be converted and his whole house not converted? His whole slave unit not converted. They said he got everybody in the house. He got everybody in that place where he was staying. I don't know if they sat down. I don't know if they stood up. But everybody was there. And the man of God, the preacher, came in. And when the preacher, Peter, came in, he began to preach Jesus. And what did it say? When he, while he, it wasn't even while it was over, brothers and sisters, but it says, while he was still preaching or speaking, guess who came? The Holy Spirit. Isn't that powerful? Amen. What a conversion. What a turning. What about you tonight? Has anybody here uh, ever uh, confessed your conversion to somebody? Pastor, I was walking this one way one time in my life. You know, I ain't take no junk from nobody. You might not still take, take junk from nobody now. I don't know. But I didn't do, I did this. I was living a riotous life, and you know, but one day somebody invited me to go to the house of God. I heard the man and woman of God preach. I heard the woman and man of God teach. I heard the choir singing. I heard the fellowship. I heard the deacons praying, and something happened to me on that Sunday morning. Yes, sir. It was not explained, but I'm just using Sunday. It don't have to be on Sunday. You know, the old preacher used to say a long time ago, brother, I met the Lord on a Tuesday. Yes, sir. I don't know when you met him, but he came to me. He came in my bedroom on a Wednesday. Uh oh. You know, so you don't know when that happens, but just say hypothetically on the Sunday morning, and then all of a sudden you went to the altar, and like the jealous said, What must I do to be saved? And now you go out, people don't even recognize you no more, right? You got the love of God in your heart and in your mind. Right, you come out, you go out and be, become a light to your children, to your family, to the people in the community. Just on last week, you were doing some stuff, and all of a sudden, you start maturing in the Lord. And it takes more than a day. You start maturing in Jesus Christ. Right, the Holy Spirit is all on you and in you, like in the house of Cornelius. Right, it is a conversion. You know, it's conversion that means to turn from one way of thinking and living to another way. 
Isn't it good to know that you can turn from darkness into as marvelous light? Yes, sir. Can you say amen tonight? Amen. Then after all of that, after all of that, I got a good one for you. Then you are committed. You are committed. When you commit, when you commit to something, you make a vow to something or to someone. I make, I am committed that I am persuaded that nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Amen. I'm so committed and persuaded by that that nothing can separate me from the love of God. I am committed to the cause of the kingdom of God. Right? The kingdom of God grows through us. It grows through our commitment. It progresses itself through our commitment to all of these other four seeds. Covenant, conviction, confession, and conversion. And because of all of those things that's bound in this kingdom message, that's bound into the reason why we serve I and mean, we are love serving at Lent, it's bound to the importance of the death and resurrection of Christ. I am committed to the cause of Christ. And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, as I take my exit. When you are committed, sometimes you become a martyr. Right? You become a martyr. The word witness comes from the word martyr. Martyr means you're willing to die for your commitment to Christ. And we just talked about it. We just taught it just the other Sunday. Was it last Sunday? About Stephen. Stephen was so committed that he was even willing to face stones of persecution. Stone him to death because of his commitment. The Apostle Paul was so committed he was willing to go to Rome knowing that he probably wouldn't make it out and he didn't because his head was chopped off by Nero. So committed to God that the disciple says, I'm going to follow him. Matthew says, I'm going to close up my tax collecting business and follow this man. The disciple says, we're going to close down, we're going to tell our, our dad, uh, Zebedee, we're going to close down our fishing business and we're going to follow this man is totally committed to God. Fully. That's why me and Trisha like to go to Sweet Frog. It means fully what? Committed. I mean fully relying on God. That's what Sweet Frog is. Fully relying on God. I didn't even know that until we went in and asked somebody. I said, oh, that's, that's, that's what we come in often. Because we want to fully rely on God. That's what happens when you're committed. Even today, who is committed to the church service? Who is committed to serving God in whatever we do? It's got to be more than just Lent. You can't just wait to Lent season and have Lent. You fast and pray and lose a little weight and go without something, without taking something in. We got to take in the covenant. We got to take in the conviction. We got to take in the confession. We got to take in the conversion. And we got to be totally committed. It's all of God. And nothing else. If God gives us 100%, why should we give God less? we got to give God more. we got to stay committed to the cause of serving Jesus, not only for us, but for others who need to hear the good news about the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So are you a willing vessel today? Are you a willing vessel? An anointed vessel? I know we can't go to a lot of places we're only limited by time and space. But we can be committed to the space that's around us. Listen, and this last thing about commitment, commitment doesn't always fall on a bed of ease. Woe to them that I ease in Zion. What do I mean by that? If you read the Bible, all 66 books of the Bible, you show me anybody in that Bible and I will buy it. Not the one that the other person is selling for $60. I don't know what he's selling. <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to know what he's selling. But if you are totally committed to, to God, and in those 66 books that you have in front of you, or wherever you may be, you show me one person that was committed that had it easy. Just one. Show me one person. Now, y'all bring it back to me, or y'all type it in. Name one person that God called that was committed to the cause of spreading, not, not only in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, the prophets that he called. 
Tell me one person, man or woman, that had to be there. So when you're committed, brothers and sisters, right, get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Because in that commitment, it's going to challenge everything that I just, that I just spoke about. Being committed, you're going to be convicted, you're going to do fast because being committed, some people are going to get on your nerves. You're going to say, well, when I get home, I'm going to let it all out. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all smiling at me, but you, you might let it out when I can't hear you. But you're about to confess because somebody does it. Mm -hmm. right. And they never conversion. So that's our lesson, our two-part lesson leading up to uh, this Good Friday service. Please be with us on this coming Friday at 10 o'clock a.m. Uh, we're going to be serving at Bear Creek, our association here in Yellowsburg, mm -hmm. excuse me, this coming Friday for our Women's Auxiliary, where yours truly will be presiding at 10 o'clock. And our good friend, Dr. Kenneth Tate from the Antioch Missionary Baptist Church will be uh, the preacher for the morning. Amen. Uh, and then on Sunday morning, why don't you chime in with us if you're not in Goldsboro. Chime in with us and share our message and our ministry with others for our 930 church school where yours truly will be teaching at 930. I have double duty this coming Sunday. I will be teaching and I will be preaching on this coming Sunday. So like we used to do a long time ago, one of my members said uh, to me some years ago, he's sitting here today, he said, Pastor, you know, people flip the church three times. He said, I don't know why the Baptist church is not a CME church. <laughs> Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter. <laughs> so please, invite somebody to come out, even if it's one person, to share with us on our Resurrection Sunday morning service and they will and we will be truly blessed by God. Amen? Amen. If you receive this two-part teaching, let us put our hands together and give it Amen. Let us bow our heads and pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you again for opening our eyes and opening our minds to receive this, your word. Father, we just thank you, God, that we have committed Christians uh, that Come Wednesday after Wednesday, Sunday after Sunday, that chime in with us, Lord, that love you so much, God, they just hate to miss out on your word. Because it's by your word where we are healed, where we mature, where we grow, where we can ask for forgiveness of our sins. And through your word, God, we are revived, we are resuscitated, we are renewed to Christ. And Father, we just thank you. Thank you. Father, we ask that you would bless all of those who are, are hurting, those who are in the hospital, maybe in nursing homes, in prison. God, we just want to actually touch their feeble bodies, touch their minds. Father, God, I ask that you bless a good friend of ours, uh, Sister Scotch Rostarjo. God, bless her father, bless her family. God, heal them in the name of Jesus. Father, God, there are many names that we know of that we can't call in our families, in our friend circles, co-workers on our jobs, in the community, that we ask that you would touch with your loving hands and wrap your loving arms of protection around them, God. Father, we ask that you would touch our politics and our political politics, God. Oh, Father, it seems like our nation is swayed so far away from you. We're supposed to be a nation that bound in Christian principles. It seems like, God, we are drifting away from the foundation of those Christian principles. So, Father God, every politician, every man and woman that represents our counties and our communities and our nation, God, would you change their heart and saturate their minds to come back to do the things that you have desired for all of us to do together, to live harmony at harmony with one another. Yes. Father God, we ask that you would bless our city here in Goldsboro. Bless all of our children. Bless all of our millennials and Gen Zs and our senior saints. Bless us, bless us all, God, and keep us in your care. Father, we thank you for Mount Calvary. We thank you for all of our covenant partners. 
And God, I know it's your will that you will prosper us as disciples of Christ, as followers of Jesus Christ. And God, if you continue to do that, we'll be so careful to give your name, the honor, and the glory. For it is in Jesus' precious and matchless name you offer this, your service prayer. And the people of God say amen. amen. One more time, let's just give God praise before we move. Have a wonderful evening. We look forward to seeing you, hopefully on Friday. And if not Friday, we'll see you early on Sunday morning. So get your Sunday school books out, get your Bibles ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. We'll see you soon.